Shalom out of Arnix. Welcome to our next session in the book of Isaiah. We are in session 11 at this time. We're working through Ariel's exegetical outline notes on the book of Isaiah, created by Dr. Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum. Okay, time for our review of last session. Last session, we were in the very important prophecy of the first coming, the virgin conception prophecy, the virgin birth prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. We saw that Isaiah 7, 14 was, was fulfilled in Matthew 1, chapter 18, and chapter, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and verses 22 and 23. Let's look, at, let's look at that section of scripture. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. So here's that, that birth in the future that the Hebrew of Isaiah 7, 14 demands. It demands a birth in the future. So we have that in Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. When his mother Miriam had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And there's the future miraculous conception that is required by the Hebrew in uh, Isaiah 7:14. A normal birth in the future and a miraculous conception in the future, both in verse 18. Now we jump down to verses 22 and 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So that's the fulfillment of Isaiah 7:14, And then we looked at some rabbinic positions regarding who Emmanuel was. And the rabbis present four positions, the son of Ahaz, in other words, Hezekiah. Secondly, the second son of Isaiah, Isaiah's second son was um, Maharshal al -Hashbaz. We'll get into, we were introduced to him in chapter eight. Uh, then another son of Ahaz, and finally, a son of the royal family. So the rabbis are not able to author authoritatively identify Emmanuel, like the Brita, the Shah can do it. So there's the prophecy of the first coming in verse 14. Then we jump back to the prophet's present time in verse 15 for a sign to a specific king in Israel, Ahaz. So there are two prophecies in Isaiah 7:14 and 7:15. There's the good timeline of your kings. Ahaz is the current king. And Isaiah 7:14 is a long-term prophecy, a distant prophecy designed to sustain the Davidic dynasty for seven hundred years, seven hundred turbulent, dangerous years until the coming of the Messiah. So the Davidic dynasty will be sustained. That is the, the hope and the comfort uh, to the Davidic dynasty. But now we move into verse 15 and we have a verse that is a, or a prophecy that is a short-term prophecy and it's designed to encourage and sustain one member of the Davidic dynasty, this member only, Ahaz, the current the current king in Isaiah's day. So after dealing with the, uh, presenting that uh, comforting prophecy to Ahaz, we jumped into the near future and looked at the outworking of that particular prophecy. Then we entered chapter eight, and in chapter eight, verses one through three, we were, I, we were uh, introduced to Isaiah's second son, Maharshal al-Hashbaz. Then we jumped into the new, near future in verses four through 10, describing the uh, Assyrian invasion of the Northern Kingdom. And this was uh, fulfilled through the campaigns of Tiglath-Pileser III. Uh, first of all, the campaign of 734 BC, he came down the coast, uh, isolating Israel and Aram from any hope from the sea or from the south. So he took care, he uh, kind of, he kind of wedged them in, in his first campaign. Then his second campaign of 733 BC, Tiglath-Pileser came in, and this time he devastated the northern kingdom of Israel. He did exactly what Ahaz wanted him to do. He did not capture Samaria at this time. The kingdom still held, but it was devastated. He returned in 732 BC, and this time he took care of Ahaz's other rival, other king, and Aram was devastated. So in 732, Ahaz's enemies were totally routed by the Assyrians. However, the prophecy 
predicts a time when Judah will be destroyed. And so the campaign of Sennacherib in 701 BC is when Judah was double-crossed by Assyria. Here's Judah, the southern kingdom. She had not been touched at this point, but now Sennacherib comes down the coast and he turns inland at Joppa and he hits the kingdom of Judah, capturing 46 fortified cities and the Assyrian flood comes up even to the neck. It comes up to Jerusalem, the head of the country, but Jerusalem does not fall. Now this map with all the colored lines shows you all the different Assyrian invasions against Israel and Judah. Many, many invasions against the, the, the land. And as the prophecy of Isaiah predicted, when this is all over, Israel will be dominated by Assyria from north to south and from east to west. In other words, total domination of the land. All right, then we are in the near future in verses 4 through 10. And now we jump to the first coming in verses 11 through 15, chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. And uh, this is where we pick it up right now. We pick it up with Emmanuel. And in verses 11 through 15, there's going to be a message to the Jewish community. The message to the Jewish community is that Emmanuel will become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now there's two aspects to the message. The first is the negative aspect in verses 11 and 12. Starting in Isaiah 8, 11, For thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, You are not to say it is a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. So the um, negative message starts with a special revelation to Isaiah. God is speaking directly to Isaiah. This is the second time we've encountered this. He says, don't walk in the way of these people. And two instructions are given that consist of practical steps to fulfill this command. First of all, don't be intimidated by cries of conspiracy. Why? Because not to follow the party line of alliance with Assyria was considered treason. So don't follow the party line. Secondly, excuse me, don't be intimidated when you don't follow the party line because Isaiah and his disciples are going to be accused of treason. So don't yield ground there. Be strong. So that's the first practical step. The second one is don't fear what they fear, and they fear Peka and resin. So that's the negative aspect. Then we come to the positive aspect of the message in verse 13. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. So first of all, the Lord is to be sanctified. His holiness is to be set apart as special, a special object of devotion and respect. And then secondly, the Lord is to be, to, to be the object of fear. Now we're not talking about terror here. We're talking about reverential awe. The Lord is to be the proper object of reverential awe. Then in verses 14 and 15, Emmanuel's relationship to his people is revealed. Verse 14, Then he shall become a sanctuary, but to both houses of Israel a stone to strike, and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them, then they will fall and be broken, they will even be snared and caught. So to believers, Emmanuel will be a sanctuary. See, the house of David is assured existence. The David, Davidic covenant will not be violated. But to unbelievers, Emmanuel will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And this includes the whole nation, not just Judah. Both houses of, interest, of Israel are included here. And we see the fulfillment of this in a number of verses in the Brith Hadashah in the New Testament. Matthew 21, verses 43 through 45. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. There's your stumbling stone. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. 
And then uh, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. They were stumbling over the stumbling stone. Luke 2.34, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, of course this is at the very beginning of Messiah's earthly life, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall. There's the stumbling stone. He's appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Romans 9, 31 to 33. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Rabbi Shoal brings that out very clearly. Just as it is written, and here's our quote, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. But we preach Messiah crucified. What is he to Jews? To Jews a stumbling block. There it is. And to Gentiles foolishness. So that's the unbelieving majority. And now in verse 24, we talk about the faithful remnant, the believing minority. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Messiah, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And finally, 1 Peter 2, 5 through 8. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus the Messiah. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So we have the faithful remnant bring, being brought out there. This precious value then is for you who believe, the faithful remnant, but for those who disbelieve, the unfaithful majority. The stone which the builders rejected, this has become the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. So this is true for every Jewish person. Yeshua is either a sanctuary or a stumbling stone right up to the present time. Now the prophecy also states that Jerusalem will be a trap and a snare and this is a reference to the judgment the judgment that came upon Jerusalem for the rejection of the Messiah in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 30, 37 through 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not will and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. That's a reference to the destruction of the temple. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so the results of this prophecy, many, many will stumble and fall and be broken and snared and taken. And remember, note the word many, not all. It's the majority that will, be, that will stumble and fall, but the faithful re remnant will be preserved. Now we say that Isaiah 8.14 is messianic in nature, uh, but do the rabbis agree with us? What would the rabbis say about Isaiah 8.14 regarding the, its messianic nature? Does it speak of Yeshua? If not, who does it speak of? Well, let's start with the idea of the son of David. The title son of David is associated with the Isaiah 8.14 in rabbinic literature, Sanhedrin 38a. The son of David cannot appear, the two ruling houses of Israel shall come to an end. That is, the exile archate in Babylon and the patriarchate in Palestine. For it is written, and here's our verse, for he shall be a sanctuary and a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel. Isaiah 8.14. So, the son of David is associated with Isaiah 8.14. Now, what is the significance of the son of David in rabbinic thought. You know, the rabbis have concluded the verse refers to the son of David. What is the significance of that term? So the significance of the title of the son of David, this comes from Encyclopedia Judaica. The article is Messiah, sub-article 
Messiah in rabbinic thought. What do they say? When the Bible stresses the nature of the age called the end of days, the rabbis focus as well on the person of their regent, the person of their king, who gives the messianic age, the Yamot HaMashiach, its very name. Mashiach, Messiah, means anointed, and in the Bible can refer to either a king or a priest. The Agadah restricts the term to the eschatological king, who is also called Malka Mashiach, King Messiah. In the Targums, he's called Ben David, son of David, and Mashiach Ben David, Messiah, son of David. The Messiah was expected to attain for Israel the idyllic blessings of the prophets. He was to defeat the enemies of Israel, restore the people to the land, reconcile them to God, and introduce a period of spiritual and physical bliss. He was to be a prophet, a warrior, a judge, king, and teacher of the Torah. There's a perfect description of Yeshua. We would agree with the characteristics of the Messiah, but is this son of David Jesus? Is he the Messiah? So we know very clearly from the rabbinic writings that son of David is a reference to the Messiah. Well, we also see in the New Testament, the Brit HaDashah, that Yeshua was proclaimed to be the son of David. He was proclaimed to be the Messiah by the Jewish multitudes. And that was uh, very clearly indicated in Matthew 21, 9 with the triumphal entry. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after him were crying out saying, Hoshiana to the son of David, Hosanna to the, to the Messiah, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's the great messianic greeting that the rabbis taught we should call out when the Messiah comes. So they are proclaiming him to be the son of David or the Messiah. They are uh, voicing the the uh, messianic greeting that they were told to voice when the Messiah came and they're praising God in the highest salvation Hoshiana means save us now son of David blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Hoshiana in the highest salvation in the highest so he was proclaimed very clearly to be the Messiah well do the rabbis agree with our position that Jesus is the Messiah or do they object to it? Well, from the Sanchino books of the Bible, we read this, uh, position number one, Emmanuel, and he's referring back to Isaiah 8, 8 there. Emmanuel is a name for the land of Israel. Huh, there it is, Emmanuel is a name for the land of Israel. In other words, it's not a name for the Messiah in spite of Sanhedrin 38a that we just read a few minutes ago. So that's the first position. Emmanuel is the name of the land of Israel, not in the name of a, the Messiah. Secondly, the reference is to God, not to the Messiah. Again, in spite of Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin 38a above. So the land of Israel or the reference is to God in general. So that's a rabbinic position on Isaiah 8.14. All right, well, let's move on then. Now, by the way, I give you that because if you share Isaiah 8.14 with your Jewish friend and he says, well, I'll go talk to the rabbi about this, this is probably what he'll come back with. The rabbi will say it's a name of the land of Israel or it's a, the, uh, it's a reference to God alone. But it's not a reference to Jesus is what the rabbis will say. So be prepared. That's why I share this to, uh, uh, so you can be prepared to defend your position that Isaiah 8.14 speaks of Jesus the Messiah. All right, let's move to the sign of Isaiah's family, chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. Now, we were in the first coming in verses 11 through 15. Now we move back to the prophet's present time in verses 16 through 20. And we come to another reference to the remnant of Israel, the believing remnant in verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So that's Isaiah's disciples. They would be the, the faithful remnant. So the law of Moses and the testimony of the prophets are possessed by the remnant. So God's word is securely bound or sealed safely with the remnant. They are going to safeguard it. Now the attitude of the remnant is brought out in verse 17. And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. So the attitude is quiet trust and waiting that's the attitude of the remnant 
in spite of the fact that God's present attitude is to hide the face from the house of Jacob. So I will quietly trust in him even though he is hiding his face. Now what does this term, the hiding of the face, mean? Let's take a quick look at it. The hiding of the face. We'll look at the concept, a scripture example, and we'll make a comment here. So the first concept, the hiding of the face, speaks of an adversarial relationship. For example, Job, Job 13, 24. Job cries out, why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? Secondly, the hiding the face results in dismay and destruction. Psalm 104, 29. You hide your face and they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire. So the hiding of the face there is parallel with taking away uh, the spirit of life from the, from the, I think those are animals there in context. Thirdly, the hiding of the face speaks of God's judgment in Deuteronomy, Micah, Isaiah. In those sections of scripture, you read something like, then my anger will be, kin kin will be kindled and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be consumed. Hiding of the face is also associated with a plea for mercy, both personal mercy and national mercy. We run across it quite a bit in the Psalms. You'll read statements like this. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and oppression? You know, remember us, in other words. It's also associated with the plea for salvation, Psalm 51, 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. In other words, cleanse me and save me. The hiding of the face will be a temporary experience for Israel, not permanent, temporary, Ezekiel 29, 39, 29. God says, I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel declares the Lord God. So it's a temporary experience. Don't let anyone ever uh, convince you that Israel has been permanently cast off by God. Simply not true. And the Messiah was rejected under this concept of, as well. Isaiah 53, 3. Like one, from whom men, like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. So the hiding of the face is not a pleasant position to be in. Don't let God hide his face from you. Always turn yourself to him in faith and trust and transparency. But the remnant's attitude is that an attitude of trust. I will wait for the Lord. I'll look to him to fulfill his words. You know, it's the same attitude that Habakkuk had in chapter 2, verse 1. All right, let's move on to verse 18. And we come across the fact that Isaiah's family are there to be signs and wonders. Isaiah 8, 18. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Now the names of Isaiah's family constitute the signs. So let's take a look at these names. We'll look at the name, the meaning of the name, and the chapters in the book of Isaiah that the name illustrates. We begin with Maharshalal Hashbaz. Swift is the booty, speedy is the prey, is the meaning of that name. Would you like to name your son that? Hey, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey, come over here. I think I'd shorten it down to Swifty, something like that. But the chapters that will be illustrated by Maharshal al Hashbaz uh, fall in Isaiah 9, 8 to 10, 4. 9, 8 to 10, 4. Then we move to the next chapter, and Sha'ar Yashuv, which means a remnant shall return. That concept will be illustrated that concept, that name, illustrates Isaiah 10, verses 5 through 34. We'll move on to the next chapter and then term the name Isaiah. Isaiah means salvation is of the Lord. That will illustrate Isaiah 11, 1 through 12, 6. So these, these names and, these, and Isaiah's family are for signs and wonders in Israel. Their names are associated with acts of God. And this comes from the Lord. The names have been divinely appointed. They're deliberately assigned to each member of the family. Next, we come to an exhortation not to seek other sources for wisdom, but to go to the law of Moses and the testimony of the prophets. So we have a warning in verse 19 against the occult. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, 
Should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? So don't visit the practitioners of the occult. This was prohibited in the Mosaic Law in at least three places. For example, Leviticus 19.31. Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Also Leviticus 20, verse 6, Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. So anyone who's trusting in the Lord should heed these words of warning. Don't turn to the occult. Don't turn to the occult. But what has the, been the history of Israel? Unfortunately, our entire history has been characterized by going to the occult right up to today. Here's that, that those, um, those pictures I scanned in in 20, 2003. In regard to that article, Meditation Goes Mainstream, here are Israelis coming back from the East, bringing Eastern religions and occult practices with them. And then, here's that blatant idol worship that occurred up on the, on the Golan Heights, where these ladies danced before this little clay idol and thanked it for life. Ugh. A little piece of clay, a piece of rock. Okay, unfortunately, that has been our history in the past, and it'll continue up until Yeshua returns. Now, the practitioners of the occult are described as chirping and muttering. In other words, they utter unclear, ecstatic sounds. That is exactly the opposite of God's Word. God's Word is in clear Hebrew. But these guys are just muttering unclear sounds. And their prophecy is general. It's not a specific prophecy as uh, in many of the, in the cases in the Bible. It's so general that the prophecy can be fulfilled no matter what happens. You know, no matter what happens, it can be fulfilled. It's like going to a Chinese restaurant and getting your fortune cookie. You know, look at this fortune cookie. The skies, the skies above will rain success onto you. <laughs> what does that mean? How do you define success? Is this, are they talking about rain on your crops? Or is this something or is this something symbolic? What, what does success mean there? I mean, this is so general, it can mean whatever you want it to mean, however you define the parts of the sentence. So it's a very, very um, general prophecy, and that's what, that's what fortune tellers can get away with. They give you very, uh, very non-specific prophecies, and then you put the fulfillment in it because of your desires. So watch out for that kind of stuff. Now, God asked two rhetorical questions in this verse. Should not a people seek after their God? The answer is yes. On behalf of the living, should you inquire of the dead? No. No. Don't go to the occult. Where is the proper source of authority? Where are you supposed to go? Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. So here's the proper source of authority, not the dead, but to the living Word of God. Not to the occult, but to the revealed Word of God. The occult means the hidden stuff, you know, the secret stuff. So don't go to the occult, but go to the revealed Word of God. There's no secrets in the revealed Word of God. We, don't, we may not understand all of it, and it may also be a little bit beyond us, but it's all there. God has revealed it clearly to us in His living Word. So, Israel and those of us who trust in the Lord should go to the testimony of the prophets and the law of Moses. We should go to the Bible. That's where, there's where, we, where we go for our authority and for our needs. Unfortunately, the Jewish community today doesn't go to the Bible. And the vast majority, I'd say about 80 to 85 percent of the Jewish community today are atheists or agnostic and those who are theists who believe in God, uh, only about 15% or less, they go to the traditions and to the sages. For example, here's a look at modern Orthodox ideology. It's in a book called Rejoice, O Youth, an Integrated Jewish Ideology by Rabbi Avigdor Miller. This is Rabbi Miller. He's no longer with us. He was considered one of the modern gedolim, one of the modern great ones in the rabbinic community. Here is uh, the cover of his book. I have a copy of it, so I scanned it in. Rejoice, O Youth. This is a modern Orthodox, uh, Orthodox ideology. 
What does he say in regard to, for example, the place of tradition? He writes, the truth is unknown to those who merely know the scriptures. In other words, you can't really under understand the scriptures as that's all you got. If you go to the Law of Moses or you go to the Testimony of the Prophets, you're, no, you're not going to understand the truth. The only way to know the truth of the scriptures is through what? Tradition. You know, we rabbis, we sages, we've got it nailed down, so you pay attention to us. Basically what he's saying there is you don't go to the, to the scriptures, you go to tradition. And that's what the Talmud is. The Mishnah and the Gemara put together make the Talmud, and that's where the, the uh, modern Orthodox rabbis go, to the writings of the sages. Not only the Talmud, but the whole uh, plethora of writings that the sages have. So what about the sages? What is the place of the rabbi or the sage? Rabbi Miller writes, support of the sages is tantamount. That word means equivalent. The support of the sages is equivalent to contact with God. So even though the command in Isaiah is to go to the Law of Moses and the Testimony of the Prophets, that has been undercut by the, <coughs> by the sages. You have to go to them to truly understand. But the problem is, if they don't uh, speak according to this word, meaning the testimony of the prophets or the law of Moses, if they don't speak according to the Bible, there's no light in them. There's no light in them. You see, the only proper criterion is the Bible, not tradition. If what, you're teach, what you be, are being taught does not conform to Scripture, there is no light in that teaching. And it doesn't matter how much ecstasy is involved, it doesn't matter how much intellect is involved. It doesn't matter how much tradition or education is involved. If what you're taught does not line up with Scripture, then there's no light in it. And you should apply that principle to these classes as well. Am I accurately teaching you what's in Scripture word by word, sentence by sentence, chapter by chapter, or not? So apply that principle to all your Bible reading and go to the scriptures, go to the scriptures. Don't go, that's your primary place. You know, you can go to theologies and you can go to the writings of, of believing authors and all that, but that's secondary stuff. The primary source is the Bible. That's where you should spend the vast majority of your time, the vast majority of your time. All right. We were in the prophet's present time in verses 16 through 20. Now we jump ahead to the near future in verses 21 and 22. And he again reiterates, Isaiah again reiterates information about the darkness to come in the near future. Verses 21 and 22. They will pass through the land hard pressed and famished, and it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. So this is the results of the coming judgment. Passing through the land, they will see darkness and devastation. They'll be heavily burdened down. They'll be hungry. They'll be eating curds and honey, meaning food will be very scarce. And the result is they're going to curse God and curse the king. They're going to curse God for the judgment, and they're going to curse the king for bringing on the judgment, for actually leading them into the judgment. And this is a typical human blame game. Transfer the blame to someone else. Point your finger at someone else. It happens from the beginning with Adam and Eve. So a typical human blame game is to reject personal responsibility. But the, re, the faithful remnant will accept personal responsibility and turn to God in repentance. So if you reject your personal responsibility, and when they curse God and the king, there'll be no help from heaven above, and there'll be no help from earth below. So a pretty bleak picture. But suddenly, and it's a big but, but suddenly in the midst of this darkness, this darkness caused by the Assyrian invasion, remember chapter 8, uh, verse 7 is the context, in spite of this darkness comes the revelation of the future glory of Galilee. You know, God always gives us hope. He never leaves us in despair. However, before we move to that hope, it's time to do a drash. 
Let's think about some thoughts of application from Isaiah 7:15 through 8:22. What can we learn for our lives from this section, section of, of Scripture? Well, the theme I chose was the sentence, do not do, the command, do not do as these people do. Where to get that information? I got that from the biblical material. Isaiah, his family, and disciples were commanded not to imitate the ways of the people around them. They were not to think the way they thought, or fear the things they feared, or consult whom they consulted for wisdom, or respond the way they responded. Isaiah and his disciples were instead to fear God, order their lives according to the principles of the Bible, wait patiently for God to act, and put their trust in God. They were to persevere in this way of life no matter what kind of accusation or taunt was thrown against them. Now, let's uh, apply this personally to our own lives. Isaiah and his disciples were living examples of Rabbi Shaul's words in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Rabbi Shaul writes, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. There's the same command. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Go to the testimony. Go to the law. You know, So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, we're tr our, our minds are transformed when we go to the Bible and line up our lives and think biblical thoughts. So in light of this application, let's get personal. In light of this application, is there something in your life that is pressuring you to conform to the world's pattern? Is there something from the world that's trying to squeeze you into its mold? Write that item down, you know? We all get hit by the world every day of our lives. It wants to squeeze us down into its pattern. When we sense that, sense that happening, let's write that down. Write that item down. Just make it very clear in your own mind. How is the world trying to squish me into its mold? Ugh. It happens every day of our lives, doesn't it? All right. Now let's move beyond the intellectual. Now let's write down how we could practically respond to that pressure. Respond in God's way. What scriptural principles could I, could you, could we bring to bear upon the situation that's hitting our lives? You know, write that down. But you know, maybe it's a tough situation and there is no way out, at least humanly speaking. You know, God will provide a way out if you trust in Him. He'll provide a way of escape. But until that way of escape comes, perhaps you have no recourse except to patiently trust God and fear God and persevere. That may be what you have to do. Just simply wait patiently, trusting God, fearing God, and persevering. Who knows? Many, many situations in our lives requires just that. So what could we do to do things God's way? That's the big question we have to answer. All right, just some thoughts of application based on Isaiah and his disciples, the faithful remnant. Now, before we move, get into chapter 9, we're right on the cusp of chapter 9. Before we get into that chapter, I want to briefly emphasize the meaning of the phrase, in that day. I need to point out that what the phrase is re referring to is determined by the context in which it is used. Remember, context is king. Never forget that. Now in Isaiah 7, 15 through 25, in that day is clearly, clearly defined by verses 18 through 23. The definition of, definition of that day is the day of the king of Assyria, his invasions of the land. Therefore, when we read that section, it's talking about the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. In our next section, we'll come across that phrase in that day again. However, the events in the next chapter have never come to pass. That's crucial. 
the events of the next chapter have never come to pass. That forces us to place those events into the future, into the tribulation period. So my point here is you can't assume that the phrase in that day always refers to the tribulation period. Most of the time it does. vast majority of the time it will. But we must study the immediate context first before, before assigning events to the tribulation. Remember, context is king. All right, let's move to chapter 9. And uh, let's see, we're in chapter 8, verses 1, 21 and 22. We're in the near future. Now we jump to chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and we take a look at the first coming, Yeshua's first coming. And we will examine the future, ga future glory of Galilee. Now I'm going to read the coming of the light. I'm going to start with chapter 8, verse 22, and flow into chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, just to emphasize the contrast here. So we'll start in verse 8, excuse me, in chapter 8, verse 22. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. There it is. A horrible curtain of darkness has fallen over the northern, uh, over uh, the northern kingdom, over Galilee. And then comes the contrast. But there will be no more gloom for, who, for her who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by way of the sea, on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. On those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So the extreme devastation of the Assyrian invasion up in the north in Galilee will in the course of time give way to bright glory. Now, here's a map of Galilee. And there were four tribes that made up the area of Galilee. Uh, Lower Galilee, uh, you find Issachar. Also in Lower Galilee, you find Zebulun. Then in Upper Galilee, Naphtali. And on the coast, Asher. Asher comes down into Galilee as well. So those are the four tribes in Galilee. So there were more than just two tribes in Galilee, but he just chooses to name two. He chooses to name two tribes. Uh, the first tribe is Zebulun. Zebulun, and where the city of Nazareth is located, Yeshua's headquarters, original headquarters, his home, where he was brought up. And secondly, he names Naphtali. And in Naphtali is the city of Capernaum, where Jesus set up his headquarters after he left Nazareth. So these are two key areas and key cities associated with the life of Yeshua. He, Isaiah also goes on to say the way of the sea. That's the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is another major area of Yeshua's ministry. Then he goes outside of uh, Israel. He says beyond the Jordan, the east bank, that's Perea. Another area of Yeshua's ministry, major area of Jesus' ministry. And then he speaks of Galilee of the Gentiles. This is the northernmost area. Had a mixed population, had a heavy Gentile uh, presence there. Up in Tyre and Sidon, that area was included as well. So those are the areas of the Messiah's ministry that will see light. Light will come to these areas. Now he goes on to say, in the former time, these areas were brought into contempt, into contempt. And there are two kinds of contempt that um, hit the Galilee. First of all, there was political contempt. And this is uh, seen under the invasions of Tiglath-Pileser III, Sargon II, and Shalmaneser V. These repeated uh, invasions by the Assyrians. So we start in 734 BC. Remember good old Tiglath-Pileser coming down the coast? He leaves uh, Judah alone, but he cuts off Israel and Aram from any help from the south of the sea. Then in 732, 733, he returns, and this time he devastates the northern kingdom of Israel. He devastates Galilee. Samaria does not fall, but Galilee is hit hard by Tiglath-Pileser III. He returns in 732, a year later, and this time he does in Aram. Then he's followed by Shalmaneser V and Sargon II. Shalmaneser V captures Samaria, 
and then his successor, Sargon II, carries out the deportation. This began the, ca the capture of Samaria was 722 BC. The deportation started around that time as well. So finally, the capital of the Northern Kingdom falls. Sargon also came back in 720 BC and ravaged the Northern Kingdom of Israel, the Galilee. And then in 713 to 712 BC, he came down the coast again, another repeated uh, incursion through the territory of the Northern Kingdom. And through it all, notice, Judah is untouched. At this point, Judah is untouched. Just the Northern Kingdom of Israel has been decimated. So that's the first contempt, the political contempt the repeated Assyrian invasions, but there's also spiritual contempt for Galilee. And this is seen in the rabbinical attitude toward uh, the area, and it's reflected also in the scripture as well. In earlier time, this contempt is reflected in the New Testament. John 1.46, for example, Nathaniel said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. And then in John 7:52, his peers are arguing with Nicodemus, and they answer him, and they say, "You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee." So there's um, a very, very low of Naz low view, a very, very low view of Nazareth and Galilee, even reflected in the New Testament. But it's also reflected in the rabbinic writings. In the Talmud, the source for this uh, quote is the Jewish Encyclopedia, the Articles Galilee. Study of the traditions was not one of the Galilean virtues, neither was their dialectic method very flexible. But it is for their faulty pronunciation that the Galileans are especially remembered. Ayan and Aleph and the gutturals generally were confounded. No distinction being made between words like Amar, Hamor, Ass, Hamar, wine, Amar, a garment, Emmar, a lamb. Therefore, Galileans were not permitted to act as readers in the public prayers. Sorry, can't do it. You gotta be from the south to read the public prayers. Gotta be from Judah to read the public prayers, not from the spies Galilee. A certain Galilean once went about inquiring, who has Amar? Foolish Galilean, they said to him, do you mean an ass for riding, wine to drink, wool for clothing, or a lamb for killing? We can't understand you, bud. You know, speak up right, speak up clearly. <laughs> you rube. So there was a very low view of Galilee. Now, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai had a low view of Galilee. He lived from 40 BC to 80 AD, 80 CE. He was a Pharisaic missionary to Galilee. He was up there to spread Pharisaic Judaism. His missionary career is summed up in the book A First Century Judaism in Crisis by Jacob Neusner. Very interesting book. Jacob Neusner writes, 18 years Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai spent in Arav, and only these two cases came before him. Two cases for him to judge by the traditions in 18 years. <laughs> Not a lot. People weren't lined up to see him, in other words. At the end, he said, Oh, Galilee, Galilee, you hate the Torah. Your end will be to be besieged. In other words, he curses Galilee. He curses Galilee. So Galilee in the former time has come under contempt, political contempt and spiritual contempt. But in the latter times, Isaiah says, it'll be the site of the Messiah's ministry. Great light will come there. Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Now when Yeshua heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, that's where he was brought up, he came and settled in Capernaum, that's where he sets up his headquarters, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. But here's the key. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. There's our guy, Isaiah. Spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And from that time Yeshua began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we uh, 
when Yeshua moved his headquarters from his hometown of Nazareth to his new quarters in Capernaum, he was fulfilling this prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. But I have another question to ask us. How long will this darkness last? So we'll take a look at the duration of the darkness, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. I'll give you the date, the event, and the oppressor. How long is this going to go on? Well, the first date is 733 BC with the conquest of the area beginning with Assyria, started in 733 or so BC. 722 BC, Israel experienced deportation again under the oppressor Assyria. 605 BC, the exile of Judah begins. This time the oppressor is Babylon. Babylon uh, put Assyria down and now conquered uh, Israel as well. So the exile of Judah begins for 70 years. 536, the 70 year exile is over. The return begins, but we're under a new oppressor. We're under the Medo-Persians. They gave permission to return, but they were still the guys in charge. We were still under their thumb. 320 BC, conquest is experienced once again, this time by the Greeks. This time by the Greeks. There was a brief respite for 100 years, starting in 166 BC, when the Maccabeans revolted against the Greeks and set up an autonomous Jewish state. But that only lasted 100 years, and in 63 BC, conquest was the experience once more as Rome came down and put us under their heel. Crunch. So the darkness was still over the land. Now in 27 AD, Yeshua begins his ministry, and so he brings spiritual light, according to, according to Isaiah chapter 9. The political darkness remains. The spiritual light is there, but the political darkness remains because Rome is still dominating the land. Sometime in the future, we don't know when in the future, uh, Isaiah 9, 3 through 7 predicts this, that Yeshua will return and he will bring political light, not only spiritual light, but political light as well, when he destroys the Antichrist, who will be our oppressor at that time in the tribulation. And that finally, that political darkness will be removed as well. And when that happens, uh, the blessings will come upon the land. All right, let's see, how much time do we have left? A few minutes. Let's go ahead and move forward a little bit. In verses one, in verses one and two of chapter nine, we were in the first coming, but now in verses three through five, we move into the kingdom. So we'll start this section that describes the messianic kingdom a little bit. We'll probably have to finish it up next session. So in chapter th nine, verse three, we take a glimpse, God gives us a glimpse of the future messianic blessings. We move into the kingdom now. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So there's going to be an increase in population. The, the nation will be reduced to a remnant during the tribulation period, but the nation will be multiplied again. That reduction of the nation to a remnant is described for us in Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9. It will come about in all the land, better translation would be all the world, because this tribulation is worldwide. It will come about in all the world, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. So 66% of the worldwide Jewish community is going to perish during the tribulation holocaust. Only one third, 33%, are going to remain. That's the remnant. The third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will be the faithful remnant. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. So the nation will be, will, will, which has been reduced, will be multiplied again after the tribulation period during the kingdom. So in the kingdom, not only an increase in population, but an increase of joy. The people in contempt and darkness will rejoice again. And this is after the tribulation judgments. And two figures of speech are used to describe this rejoicing. First, the joy of harvest. After much, much work, the farmer 
rejoices. And we see a couple of sections of scripture that emphasize this. Deuteronomy 16 verses 13 through 15. You shall celebrate the feast of booths seven days after you've gathered in your threshing floor and your wine vat and you shall rejoice in your feast. There's harvest. You and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants and the Levite and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who is in your towns. Seven days you shall celebrate a feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses. Because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. There is the joy of harvest. And Psalm 126, 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. Reaping always brings sh joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, will indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him when his work produces the harvest. So that's the first picture, the joy of harvest. The second picture is the joy of dividing spoil. After the turmoil of, turmoil of war, then the soldier uh, d finds his reward and, rejo and divides the spoil. Psalm 119, 162, I rejoice in your word as one who finds great spoil. So there's a soldier rejoicing over the victory in battle. Well, that's all we have time for today. We'll pick it up next session. We'll be in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 4 in our next session. Thanks for being our students. We'll see you then. Lahitra Ode.